Are you tired of the wokeness of Wizards of the Coast? Are you tired of their terrible business practices? Well, let's learn a new system. The Cypher System by Monty Cook Games is an excellent alternative to D&D 5e, and I'm going to help you transition. I first heard about the Cypher System when WebDM did a video on Numenera, and I've only recently gotten into it. I have yet to run a game or play, but I'm getting really comfortable with the rules, and I wanted to make this video to help myself and everyone transition over from 5e. You can get this nice physical copy, a PDF, or both on Monty Cook Games. Now let's get into this. Starting with character creation. Instead of a race and class, you have a type, descriptor, and focus. You have the optional use of flavor for more thematic customization. Instead of levels 1 through 20, you have tiers 1 through 6. Instead of all your attributes, you only have might, speed, and intellect pools. Your type determines your pool stats, max effort, edge stats, max ciphers, weapon skills, starting equipment, and special abilities at each tier. Your background determines your connection to the setting, and your type has a d20 table with recommendations, or you may create your own. Choosing a flavor, Stealth, Technology, Magic, Combat, or Skills and Knowledge allows you to swap your type abilities at each tier. Your Descriptor offers extra abilities, inabilities, skills, and modifications to your stat pools. Your Focus makes your character unique. It gives you an initial ability and access to new ones at each tier. Your Foci are the abilities gained from your Focus. At Character Creation, you have the option of choosing one character arc for free. During gameplay, you must spend 1 XP to take on a new arc and shouldn't have more than 4 at a time. Character arcs are essentially side quests you can pick up and assign to yourself. Ciphers are single-use effects that are always consumed when used. Manifest ciphers have a physical form, and subtle ciphers do not. Players can only have a few ciphers at a time, and as you'll find new ones frequently, you shouldn't hesitate to use your cipher abilities. Only players roll dice in the cipher system. You need a d6 for recovery, and a d20 for everything else. This is the bread and butter of the cipher system, the task difficulty chart. Instead of adding modifiers to your d20 rolls, you use your skills, assets, and effort to ease a task's difficulty. Ease means to lower a task difficulty by one step. Step, and hinder means to increase a task difficulty by one step. Having an inability in a skill means those tasks are hindered. Being practiced in a skill means those tasks are unmodified. If you aren't practiced with a type of weapon, you have an inability in it. Being trained in a skill means those tasks are eased. Being specialized in a skill means those tasks are eased by two steps. Skills can never decrease a task by more than two steps. An asset is anything that helps a character with a task and usually eases a task by one step. Assets can never ease a task by more than two steps and more than two steps steps from assets don't count. Tasks are eased by one step for each level of effort applied to them. You can apply one level of effort by spending three points from the stat pool related to the task and two points for each additional point. You can also use effort to apply more damage, dealing an additional three points for each level of effort applied. You can apply effort to multiple aspects of a single action, such as both easing the attack and applying additional damage. Every character has a maximum level of effort they can apply to a single task. Effort can never ease a task by more than six steps. Free effort abilities can exceed your character's effort maximum, but never the six-step limit. As a player, if you're rolling on a task and you're specialized in a skill, you can decrease that task difficulty by two steps. If you have two assets or an asset that decreases something by two steps, then that's four steps. And you can apply up to six levels of effort. So that's ten steps overall, theoretically. You could make an impossible roll a routine roll with all of that. If a player fails a task, they can retry it, but you must apply at least one level of effort. This is a new action and takes the same amount of time. Having an edge in a stat pool reduces the cost of using special abilities or applying effort. With a stat edge of 3, you can apply one level of effort for free. You can only use edge for a particular stat once per action, and everyone only has one action per turn in combat. XP is not gained through killing monsters or milestones. It's earned through finishing character arcs, discovery, and GM intrusions. GM intrusions introduce a complication for a player by rewarding them with one XP and an additional XP to give to a fellow player. If a player modification determines automatic success, the GM can intrude to force a roll at the original difficulty level or target number 20, whichever is lowest. If a player rolls a 1 on a die, the GM can intrude without giving the player any XP. Unlike 5e, XP isn't used exclusively for leveling up, it's also used to gain a lot of other things. A player can spend 1 XP to refuse a GM intrusion. A player can spend 1 XP to use a player intrusion. Each type has a list of suggested intrusions, but the GM may allow you to make your own. A player can spend 1 XP to acquire a general subtle cipher, or attempt to roll for a specific subtle cipher, which is an intellect roll equal to the cipher level plus 1. A player can spend 1 XP to reroll any roll in the game, even one they didn't make. A player can spend 2 XP to gain a short or medium term benefit in the form of a specific skill, or rarely as a device, ability, or power. A player can spend 3 XP to gain a long term benefit such as a contact, home, title, job, or wealth. A player must spend 4 XP on each of the 4 advancement options to reach the next tier. 
the fifth special options can replace one of the four. Let's get into combat. Instead of dexterity checks, player initiative is determined by a speed roll against a creature's target number. Creatures have a level from 1 to 10, just like tasks, and that determines their difficulty level and target number. Whether you attack a creature or a creature attacks you, you roll against their target number. Weapon damage is not rolled, it is a flat number augmented only by special rolls. Your attacks are hindered while wielding a weapon you are not practiced with. Creatures generally do damage equal to their difficulty level. Light weapons do 2 damage and attacks are eased with them as they're fast and easy to use. Medium weapons do 4 damage and they're most weapons, anything that can be used in one hand, even if it's often used with 2. Heavy weapons do 6 damage, anything that must be used with 2 hands. Great sword, massive rifle. The following numbers result in a special roll. 1. GM intrusion, similar to a crit fail. 17 plus 1 damage. 18 plus 2 damage. 19, a minor effect or add plus 3 damage. A minor effect can also be used out of combat. 20, a major effect or add plus 4 damage. The major effect can also be used out of combat. If the player spent points from a stat pool on the action, the player regains those points too on the 20. Don't forget that. Armor doesn't make you harder to hit. It only reduces the damage you take and increases the cost of using effort from your speed pool. You can only wear one type of armor at a time, but multiple sources, such as a force field, combined to provide your total armor rating. Wearing armor you are not practiced with increases your speed effort cost by one. Light armor gives you plus one damage reduction and increases your speed effort cost by one. Medium armor is plus two and heavy armor is plus three. Instead of hit points, your stat pools and damage track determine how far you are from death. Both players and objects have four states on their damage track, while NPCs usually have health equal to their target number. Unless specified, damage is applied to your might pool first. When a stat pool reaches zero, you move one step down the damage track. Attacks that specifically deal speed or intellect damage ignore armor. Damage is applied to your pools in this order. Your might pool unless it's zero, your speed pool unless it's zero, and then your intellect pool. Hail, which is normal, at least one or more in all three pools with no penalties from harmful conditions. Impaired, which is wounded. Effort costs one additional point per level applied, and you ignore minor and major effects, and rolls of 17 through 20 only do plus one damage. Debilitated, which is critically injured. You can only take an action to move an immediate distance, probably crawling, unless your speed pool is zero, then you're just laying there debilitated. And then four is dead. The object damage track is intact, then minor, which is slightly damaged, reducing its level by one, major, critically damaged, broken, no longer functioning, and destroyed, which is ruined and can't be repaired. Range is generalized using four distance categories. Immediate, within reach or a few steps, up to 10 feet. Short, greater than 10 and up to 50 feet. Long, greater than 50 and up to 100 feet. And very long, greater than 100 and up to 500 feet. Anything beyond is specified such as a thousand feet, a mile, etc. Instead of short and long rests, you can rest up to four times a day to make a recovery roll, which is 1d6 plus your tier level. First, it's one action, and that can be done in combat. Second, it's 10 minutes. The third, it's one hour. And the fourth is 10 hours. And after that much rest, it's assumed to be a new day, and your next rest resets back to one action. Using a recovery roll to raise a pull from zero to one automatically moves you up one step on the damage track. If your pulls are above zero and special damage has moved you down the damage track, you can use your recovery roll to move up one step instead. In combat, everyone gets to take one action in a round. You can move, and there's four options. Move an immediate distance and attack, move a short distance, move a short distance and attack, making a speed task of four, or move a long distance also making a speed task of four. You can attack, the melee can be a might or speed action, range is almost always a speed action, and special abilities tend to be intellect unless specified. You can activate an ability, which are granted by types, foci, and flavors, as well as ciphers and other devices. You can wait, which is similar to holding your action in 5e. You can react to another creature's action, and when it triggers, you react first. You can also do something else. Don't feel constrained by the mechanics. Skills are not required to attempt an action. You can do whatever you think of. Just ask your GM. Defend isn't a traditional action you take on your turn. It's essentially a reaction. It's a player-only action triggered by an attack. Speed is for ducking and blocking. Might could be to resist poison. And intellect is psychological. There's special damage and many different attack modifiers in special situations, and they're on page 219 to 222, but I'm not going to cover them in this video. There's also additional rules for various different situations covered in page 226 to 229. Cooperative actions are quick options that can be used for NPC followers and their ways for players to work together. None of these options can be used at the same time by the same characters. Helping eases someone else's task as an asset. It is eased by two steps if you are trained or specialized and has no effect if you have an inability. And remember, assets can only decrease a task's difficulty by two. Distraction hinders a foe's attacks for one round. Draw the attack draws a foe's attack and hinders your defense by two steps. Normally succeeds without a roll but may require an intellect action to get them to attack you. Take the attack, you sacrifice yourself to take a successful attack against a nearby comrade as a reaction and you take an additional point of damage on top of what they would have taken. 
you can only do that once per round. Like skills, equipment is kind of loosey-goosey, make up what you need and write it in there. Whether the campaign uses dollars, pounds, euros, credits, gold pieces, or bottle caps, everything is simplified into five price categories. Inexpensive, something that common people might buy. A simple meal or a drink in the bar. A pen and some paper. A book or a magazine. Moderately priced, something that common people buy, but not too often and not in great quantities. A small piece of furniture. A major entertainment. An expensive meal. A new outfit. Expensive, something that would strain a common person's finances. Rent on a simple apartment. A major piece of furniture. A very nice outfit. The cost to travel a long distance. Very expensive, probably out of the reach of most people except in very special circumstances such as jewelry and luxury furnishings. Exorbitant, something only the very rich can afford, such as a very nice house, a ship, extremely expensive jewelry, or art. In general, weapons and armor are moderately priced for light, expensive for medium, and very expensive for heavy. And in relation to each other, moderately priced items are 10 times more expensive than inexpensive. Expensive are 100 times, very expensive are 1,000 times, and exorbitant are 10,000 times more expensive than inexpensive items. Artifacts are more powerful than equipment and cannot simply be purchased. Artifacts have a level and a rate of power depletion. When an artifact is used or activated, the player rolls the designated die. If the die shows the depletion number, the item works, but that is its last use. A depletion entry of dash means that the artifact never depletes, and an entry of automatic means that it can only be used once. Depowered artifacts can sometimes be recharged using the repair rules, depending on the item's nature. Other special abilities can also repower an expended item, but probably for only one use. After a player finds an artifact, identifying it is a separate intellect task. The difficulty of the task is usually equal to the artifact's level. Identifying it takes 15 minutes to 3 hours. If the players can't identify an artifact, they can bring it to an expert to be identified or, if desired, traded or sold. Players can attempt to use an artifact that has not been identified, which is usually an intellect task equal to the artifact's level plus 2. Once players identify an artifact, using it for the first time requires an additional intellect action, usually equal to the artifact's level. The name of the game, ciphers, are far more akin to special abilities than to gear. In many campaigns, ciphers aren't physical objects. They might be a spell, blessing from a god, or a quirk of fate that gives a momentary advantage. In a fantasy game, they might be potions, scrolls, or charms. In a science fiction game, they might be interesting throwaway devices or alien crystals of unknown providence. In other games, they might just represent good fortune or sudden inspiration. Unless the cipher's description says otherwise, it works only for the character who activates it. Ciphers don't have to be used to make room for new ones. Manifest ciphers can be discarded or stashed for later use, unless stolen. Subtle ciphers can be lost as an action to free up room for new ciphers, although once discarded in this way, they are gone and can't be recovered. There's rules for crafting, building, and repairing that follow this chart, but I'm not going to cover them because this video is already taking long enough and I wanted to make it as short as possible. I might cover it in a more advanced video on the cipher system as I continue on. Thank you for watching all the way through. I hope you learned something about the cipher system or at least you got interested in it and got your foot in the door and I hope I helped you. If you'd like to support me or even join me on Discord, you can find me on Patreon at SlimJones76. We'd love to have you in our fellowship of gamers where you can play with us or even run your own TTRPG games or whatever you want. Go to Monty Cook Games, get the book, get the PDF, break away from 5e, break away from Wizards of the Coast. Let's do our own thing. We don't need to be tied down into one system. It's okay to expand and look at other games. Do you like other systems? What other systems besides 5e and the Cypher system do you like? Comment down below. Other than that, like, share, subscribe. I'd love to see you in the future on my Patreon, like I said, and Slim Jones, out.